Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the In Conversation with Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Heng Swee Keat. I'm your MC, Deborah. This session is jointly organised by the World City Summit, Singapore International Water Week and Asia Infrastructure Forum. We are here at the Marina Bay Sands Hybrid Broadcast Studio in Singapore with an in-person audience. We are pleased to welcome you, our online audience who have just joined from around the world. In a few moments, I will introduce Mr. Heng Swee Keat, Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic Policies. DPM Heng will be giving a keynote address, and this will be followed by a moderated dialogue 
focus on how Singapore can respond to the pandemic, climate crisis and other disruptions to emerge more sustainable and resilient. For our online audience, please note that simultaneous interpretation in Mandarin is available to World City Summit and Asia Infrastructure Forum virtual audiences in a separate channel. We are very honoured today to have Mr. Heng Sui Kiet, Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic Policies. Without further ado, let's welcome DPM Heng. DPM, please. A very good afternoon to, to everyone and to those of us who are joining us online. Uh, most welcome to this uh, special event. Now, it's been more than a year since COVID-19 disrupted the world. The toll on lives and livelihoods have been staggering. Almost 4 million people have lost their lives. And the equivalent of more than 250 million jobs globally has been wiped out. Global vaccination is underway. This provides some hope. But new and more virulent strains have emerged triggering new waves all over. COVID-19 may be with us for some time. It may become endemic, and learning to live with it will be critical to our future. Beyond the immediate public health crisis and the global economic fallout, COVID-19 has also disrupted our world in other lasting ways. The pandemic has accelerated existing structural shifts and created new ones. The global shift to digital is a clear example as we go online to meet our needs, including connecting with others like in today's hybrid event. I hope you have had a good discussion since this morning. The pandemic is challenging us to rethink our assumptions and our ways of doing things. One key assumption that is being questioned is the role of cities. For centuries, cities have been the lifeblood of economic, social and cultural activities. More than half the world's population live in cities, and this is growing. Cities account for more than 80% of global GDP today. But with the experience of this pandemic, will cities still have the same relevance? The high population densities and concentration of activities in cities make them more vulnerable. Some people have moved out of cities to work remotely from the countryside. But the reality is far more complex and nuanced. The virus has, has had an uneven impact across cities and even within the same city. Population densities matter, but other factors, such as access to quality health care, trust in government, and compliance with safe management measures, matter just as much, if not more. There are early signs that people are making their way back into cities. This is not surprising. There are good reasons why cities have flourished over the centuries. The economies of agglomerations are a powerful driving force for urbanisation. Cities have thrived as hotbeds of innovation, creativity, knowledge sharing and networking. While virtual interactions are useful, this cannot fully replace face-to-face -face interactions and the sparks that some call the collaborative chains of creativity. So I believe that cities will remain powerful magnets, bringing people together to explore, learn, create and interact with one another. Urbanisation will remain a powerful force driving growth post-COVID-19. In fact, the pandemic has presented us with a once-in-a-generation opportunity to re-envision and build cities of tomorrow. The immediate lesson from COVID-19 is the need to develop greater resilience. Cities thrive when they are part of a global network and efficient supply chains. These global linkages have powered global growth. Over time, cities have become more interconnected and interdependent. But this also means that cities are more vulnerable to disruptions in other parts of the world. 
The pandemic is a clear example, and so was a recent blockage in the Suez Canal. The pandemic has also exposed a lack of crisis preparedness, with many cities experiencing a severe crunch in healthcare capacity. Cities of the future will need to be resilient besides being efficient. We'll need to review our planning assumptions and infrastructure needs. The pandemic is also a sharp reminder that countries must work together to better respond to complex global challenges like climate change. COVID-19 will fade at some point, but the global climate challenge will be with us for generations. Cities are a critical part of any solution. They produce 70% of global CO2 emissions. As the economy picks up, we have a window of opportunity for a green recovery by investing in sustainable solutions. More broadly, COVID-19 has reinforced the value of building livable cities. I've spoken about resilience and sustainability, which are critical in ensuring that our cities remain livable. But livability goes beyond that. Livability is fundamentally about people, enabling people to flourish and improving their quality of life. This includes fair and inclusive access to basic necessities, such as clean water, sanitation, and affordable housing, and the good redesign of spaces, including indoor and common spaces to enhance the health and well-being of residents. So let me offer three suggestions on how we can build more resilient, sustainable and livable cities of tomorrow. This can be summarised as the three I's, innovate, invest and integrate. First, to push the next bounds of livability and sustainability for urban living, we will need to innovate. We must explore new possibilities in how we plan and run our cities. With the pandemic changing our daily routines, how can we redesign our homes, public transport networks and cities to be more livable and sustainable? For example, prior to COVID-19, Singapore has been building polycentric city. Instead of a single central business district, we have multiple regional centres to bring work and amenities closer to homes and to reduce commuting times. COVID-19 has given us fresh impetus to these efforts. The pandemic has also shown us the value of integrating green spaces within our urban landscapes. Like in many cities, footfall has increased significantly in our parks and nature reserves. In Singapore, we value greenery despite our land constraints. For example, the Gardens by the Bay is a green space spanning more than 100 hectares in the heart of the city. We'll make our green spaces even more accessible. By 2030, every household can be within a 10-minute walk to a park. This represents our steadfast commitment to building a green and livable city. Apart from shifts in urban planning, we also need innovative solutions to make our cities more sustainable and resilient. One example is water. Addressing urban water needs is not new. The Roman aqueducts were built 2,000 years ago to transport water into cities. Today, climate change has exacerbated the water challenge, with many cities facing severe water stress. Innovation will be critical in overcoming this challenge. Technologies like desalination are useful, but the key to do so but the key is to do so in an energy-efficient and cost-effective way. Smart metering and automated leakage detection systems can also help to stretch every drop of water. To catalyse urban innovations, we need to invest in R&D. This is why Singapore has a US$19 billion research, innovation and enterprise plan for R&D efforts over the next five years. One major focus is on urban solutions and sustainability to ensure that Singapore's highly built-up environment remains climate resilient and livable. One example of this effort is a project called Cooling Singapore. 
There are studies showing that Singapore is heating up twice as fast as the rest of the world. This is partly due to global warming, compounded by the urban heat island effect, where our buildings and roads trap the heat from our tropical environment. Greenery helps to some extent, but more needs to be done. New solutions could include the use of cool paints and reflective glass coatings to lower absorption of heat energy from the sun. The Cooling Singapore project is also developing a digital urban climate twin to simulate how the various features of a city, such as the streetscape, buildings and climate conditions, affect the ambient temperature. And it's not just a Singapore effort to tackle these challenges. We can achieve more if we work together. So I'm glad that Cooling Singapore project is a multi-institutional initiative between Singapore and international partners from Switzerland, Germany, the US and the UK. The solutions developed will be useful not only for reducing urban heat in Singapore, but also for cities around the world. It is also in the same spirit that international events like the Singapore International Water Week are organised. They serve as useful platforms to showcase innovative solutions and spark new collaborations. Second, to build livable and sustainable cities post-COVID, we will need to invest. Even prior to COVID-19, there was recognition of the infrastructure financing gap in many cities. In Asia alone, the ADB had estimated an infrastructure gap of 1.7 trillion US dollars per year till 2030, with needs ranging from transport to telecommunications infrastructure. With the structural changes that have been accelerated by COVID-19, we'll have to speed up our investments, including in digital infrastructure, like fibre broadband and 5G networks, to harness the digital wave, social infrastructure, such as hospitals and schools, to enhance the social resilience of cities, greener buildings that are more energy efficient, and cleaner energy sources, such as solar panels and wind turbines. Given the large and growing financing needs, we need to improve the flow of capital across borders to benefit communities in Asia and beyond. To help address this, Singapore set up Infrastructure Asia to facilitate the flow of funds and expertise into Asia, especially from the private sector, to bridge this infrastructure gap. This week's Asia Infrastructure Forum is a part of this effort to bring the various stakeholders to work together. An important aspect is to catalyse green financing. Singapore accounts for over one-third of the sustainability-linked loan markets in the Asia-Pacific today. The Singapore government is also taking the lead by issuing green bonds to support the financing of up to 15 billion US dollars of public infrastructure projects. We welcome further collaborations to harness the power of finance to promote cleaner and greener forms of energy and activities in the region. Outside of urban spaces, we can also invest in nature-based solutions for carbon abatement. Nature-based solutions have the potential to provide one-third of the global mitigation necessary to stabilise warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. For example, Southeast Asia is home to the largest blue carbon stock in the world, with the largest areas of mangrove swamps and seagrass meadows in Indonesia and the Philippines. To realise this potential, we need to attract investments. One way to do this is to create vibrant exchanges for the trading of carbon credits. Singapore will be launching one such global carbon exchange, Climate Impact X, later this year. This will allow large-scale, high-quality carbon credits to be sold through standardised contracts. Climate Impact X is one way Singapore is doing our part to contribute to a green recovery in the region. This brings me to my last point, the need to build, to better integrate our efforts so that we can build on one another's strengths to create a more sustainable and livable future.
COVID-19 has shown how interdependent and interconnected our world is and why global cooperation is critical. While there have been some shortcomings in the global response to COVID-19, there are also bright spots. One such area is the unprecedented level of information sharing and cooperation in science and technology. So let us build on this momentum. For example, as the digital economy grows, we should collectively expand digital trade by harmonizing standards and enabling trusted data flows across borders. To build a more resilient world, we also need to better facilitate supply chain linkages through digitalization and the single window for the movement of goods. As key engines of growth and innovation, cities will have a critical role to play in forging a stronger network of cooperation. By working in partnership, cities can amplify our growth and innovation efforts and build on one another's strengths. We can build networks of collaboration to prototype ideas across different contexts and to enhance connectivity among cities. This can take different forms. One example is a smart city partnership between Singapore and Shenzhen. This seeks to strengthen digital connectivity and collaboration by piloting paperless cross-border trade through mutual recognition of electronic trade documents. Another example is the Global Innovation Alliances, Alliance, which connects Singapore to innovative cities around the world. This initiative encourages aspiring innovators and students to learn and collaborate with innovators based in other cities. This network currently spans 15 cities. We'll be expanding it to over 25 cities by 2025. We hope that Singapore can play a useful role as a global Asia node, as a gateway for cities around the world, for people in cities around the world to explore opportunities in Singapore, and for Singapore to serve as a launch pad for people in Asia to expand into global markets. It is also this same spirit of cooperation and learning that platforms such as the World City Summit seek to harness. So in conclusion, COVID-19 has disrupted our way of life, especially in cities. But I believe cities are here to stay. Cities will remain the best venues for humans to explore, learn, and interact, to flourish as individuals, and to collaborate and achieve more together. But COVID-19 has also given us a once-in-a-generation opportunity to rethink how we can plan, plan and run our cities so that we can build more sustainable, resilient and livable cities for future generations. To do this well, we must innovate, invest and integrate our efforts. I'm confident that if we put in our best efforts, we'll not only manage the current pandemic well, but we can also manage other challenges and disruptions in the years to come and emerge stronger. So I look forward to exchanging views with all of you in the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, DPN. May I invite DPN to take your seat on stage for the moderated dialogue. Joining him on stage, we have our moderator, Ambassador Ong Keng Yong. He is the Executive Deputy Chairman of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Let us welcome Ambassador Ong. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister, for that uh, very detailed and enlightening speech. But I thought that if you allow me, I would take this opportunity to flesh out a bit more of some elements which you have covered in your speech. Sure. Uh, but before that, I want to encourage all the participants here to respond to the poll that we are going to conduct in the course of this next 15, 20 minutes, because the last part of my this time with Deputy Prime Minister 
will be picking up on your answer to the poll. <laughs> so, uh, BPM, uh, the last question is from the audience. Okay. Not from me, but they have to <laughs> respond to the poll. Um, listening to your speech, huh, I think maybe I should just zero in a bit on the um, element of leadership and governance, which is implicit mm. in parts of your speech, but also very explicit in certain of the examples you have given. So, Singapore is part of Southeast Asia and we are in uh, this regional grouping called ASEAN. I wonder whether you can elaborate a bit more on how Singapore and ASEAN together, uh, we can catalyze new area of growth uh, following this pandemic, yeah, following the disruptions, as well as the opportunity that uh, all these disturbances has given us. Yeah. Well, thanks, King Yong, for that question. And I think you could expect uh, a question like this from the former Secretary General of ASEAN, that I see that it's, it's excellent that your heart is still very much with ASEAN. Now, in fact, uh, for, for, our, uh, for our audience online, you know, ASEAN is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and it is a grouping of the 10 uh, countries in Southeast Asia. It just uh, celebrated the 50th anniversary not long ago. And uh, the, what is it that uh, we can do in ASEAN to catalyze new areas of growth. So I'll say the first, uh, we should build on what we have been doing. I think ASEAN has been pursuing economic integration for many, many years now. In fact, the ASEAN Free Trade, starting with the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, the ASEAN Economic Community. Uh, I, I was very much involved in the negotiations of many of this uh, in my earlier days in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. So I would say that um, ASEAN has very good potential uh, for growth as well as for closer economic integration. So we must, um, especially during a, a pandemic period like this, and where the global consensus, where the consensus for globalization is fraying, for ASEAN to continue to do our part to ensure that we stay economically integrated. Because the global I mentioned in my speech that you know, cities have been vibrant and in fact, globalization have been the important driver of growth uh, all these uh, all this years. And reforming WTO rules and so on are one aspect of it, but so would the uh, negotiations of new rules for trade, uh, the formation of free trade areas. And I would say that the recent conclusion of the RCEP uh, and um, the CPTPP and so on are all very important aspects and I hope that many more countries can come on board to sustain this globalization. But within ASEAN itself, we must continue with our economic integration. And this integration now with digitalization playing a more important role in the future, it's important for us to accelerate the work on that. Now, um, Singapore and Switzerland are you know, conveners of this global discussion on e-commerce. And within ASEAN, we have our e-commerce agreement. But, within, but beyond that, I think we can do a lot more in terms of a digital economy agreement. Singapore have done it with uh, several countries, including uh, New Zealand, Australia, and Chile. So I think we should think about what next and how do we prepare for that. The other aspect is, um, when we are exposed to globalization, then dealing with structural changes in our economy will become even more important. So how do we ensure that our people are equipped to deal with these structural changes? And there I think cooperation in the areas of training, in the areas of uh, human capital development will be quite critical. And ASEAN is in a very, very uh, good state uh, to make full use of this because many parts of ASEAN have fairly youthful population. And so we should try and build on that. And at the same time, I think we need to think about the new areas of growth. And the new areas of growth will be in areas like you know, the uh, digital economy, as well as in the green uh, economy. I mentioned in my speech that you know, Indonesia and Philippines have uh, some of the largest uh, blue carbon stock. And so 
these are areas for which we can grow and develop. But most of all, I, I said that for, for us in, the, in ASEAN, we should encourage our businesses to work more closely together. The, by encouraging our business chambers, our businesses to collaborate with one another, I think we can do a lot more and to stay open to collaborating with partners all around the world. Uh, the, while we have trade tensions uh, between the US and China, I think the global economy is more than just US and China, and that, so we should collaborate across different parts of the world, particularly in new growth areas. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. In my interaction with most of the younger ASEAN citizens in our region. Uh -huh. I think the two most important things they have in their head and we always try to throw at us whom they think have some say in whatever is happening in Southeast Asia and ASEAN. Uh, number one, uh, how to green our economy. Uh -huh. And number two, how to digitalize our economy. So what you have just said is uh, very important. And actually, uh, as I used to work in ASEAN, I still follow the numbers. Yeah. More than 60% of our young population under 35 in ASEAN. Yes. Uh, uh, more than 60% under 35 years old. Mm. So if you go around the region, definitely you cannot run away from a question like, how do we do more green things? Mm -hmm. How do we digitize more? Um, in that respect, just now in your speech, you talk about the uh, green bonds and green financing. So I wonder whether, you know, looking at this uh, uh, post-pandemic situation, how do you think that we in Singapore can facilitate green financing even more since we are an acknowledged uh, financial centre in our region? Well, I think first let me say that I th the a green financing will be important as part of our overall agenda of moving towards a green recovery because essentially we are talking about the allocation of capital and if capital can be allocated in ways that promote certain objective and that will be very valuable and the agenda is not just in ASEAN or in Asia in fact I would say that probably the Europeans are even more uh, advanced in this I have met many of my European counterparts such as business leaders mm. who spoke about this uh, green agenda and the importance of uh, flowing finance and into these areas. So finance as a, in, the, in the allocation of capital will have a, a critical role to play. Now the question is how to do that well because uh, the high quality uh, projects are important. The, what you don't want is to have a lot of uh, what, invest, what some people call uh, cynically greenwashing. It's actually not a terribly green project, but by just tagging on the line. So the verification will be important, the verification of whether this indeed is a, clear, is a case, and uh, the disclosures by financial institutions on whether these are indeed uh, green, and also the uh, exact nature in which this financing can take, because I think a, a green infrastructure and a green building will be maybe slightly different from, say, a green... Uh, new industry development. So having clarity on that is important. So that's why I think MAS has uh, issued the, uh, they set up a green finance industry task force to launch uh, this initiative. They come out with guidelines and, uh, and, and other uh, work with the industry. But at the same time, I would say that uh, it is very important too for governments to support this. And in the case of the Singapore government, as you know, I've moved the bill in Parliament to set up, to have this uh, significant infrastructure borrowing. And as part of our borrowing, we're going to issue 15 US dollars, 15 billion US dollars of uh, public infrastructure projects through green bonds. Uh, we'll be issuing green bonds for these projects and uh, working out the kinds of projects that will qualify. Now, one example is the Tuas Nexus which will be Singapore's first integrated water and solid waste treatment, which, is, which we hope to complete by 2025. So by staging this and by the issuing of Green Bond, we hope to catalyze the development of the market. We hope to provide some kind of uh, uh, 
references for which other bonds uh, can be priced. We hope to develop the guidelines. And at the same time, we can work together with our partners all over the world, in our financial institutions, in our multilateral development banks. The World Bank's infrastructure hub is uh, in Singapore, and there's a lot of work we can do with them. We have, uh, uh, within ASEAN, I think ASEAN can afford to issue uh, more green finance, because today I think ASEAN accounts for only 3% of the global uh, green finance. So there is quite a lot of catch-up to do. But I would say that I remain optimistic that the Asian region uh, will recover from uh, COVID, will continue to grow, and the fundamentals have not been damaged. And if so, we really must aim for a better recovery and a green recovery must be an important part of our agenda. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. May I just add one point, which in my conversation with some of the young people in ASEAN, uh -huh. they always, as you mentioned, when you talk about green finance, they actually don't really fully appreciate what is covered by green financing. Right. So therefore, I think going forward, I, we should have a bit more uh, information, more public awareness on what is really green financing. Yes. Because as you mentioned, some of these projects are used for green projects yes. yeah, or to green the economy as we call it. But apart from that, very few people fully appreciate what is involved in mm. Mm. Uh, green financing. Yes. So I think a bit more uh, information, tell practical stories will be helpful. Yes. Uh, that comes to my next point, which is about how can the citizens and the businesses contribute to all this. Yeah. Yeah. Government can do green financing, uh, government can put out very good uh, policy measures, and in the case of Singapore, we can talk to the other ASEAN colleagues to uh, 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 also do the same thing in their respective uh, economy and countries. But what more can we uh, as citizens, ordinary uncle, auntie out there, as we call it in Singapore, <laughs> Uh, discovered in Singapore uh, and businesses nowadays businesses are big some of them are huge so there is a kind of expectation that they should also be a bit more active uh, and government must be prepared to give them more role right yeah so maybe you'd like to elaborate on some of these uh, aspects in your mind no I, I would turn it around and I would say that it's not just government giving them more role, but they should be taking on more role. <laughs> but let me, let me start with uh, the, the individuals first, because I think uh, it must start with us as individuals, right? So what is it that you and I can do? And, uh, you know, this whole movement of um, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, has been with us for quite some time. Uh, in, in our case, you know, we have, uh, we have a campaign on <coughs> saving water, using water properly for many, many years now. And it just shows the importance of, for us to uh, deal with this issue squarely. So we as individuals must do our part uh, to observe the three R's. And that's where I think the, uh, uh, we will also need to deal with uh, the externality as a result mm. of our action. So in one of my budgets, one of my many budgets last year, I mean, we have imposed a, a carbon tax on uh, businesses, particularly those uh, that are highly, uh, that are high emitters of carbon. So, and that fund is in turn used to deal with that. I was talking to this with uh, a banker whom I knew from Europe. He visited me maybe about 18 months ago or more, uh, before COVID. And he was telling me that uh, the businesses in uh, Europe are under a lot of pressure from consumers. So I would say that we as consumers uh, will be the ones that will also shape this because your action and my action in how we reduce, reuse, recycle and the choices that we make will shape the way that companies will respond to. So I asked him, so what do people do? They say, well, if your company does not uh, embrace a green agenda, the young consumers in particular boycott you. So they all had to uh, do more of that. And I, th I think that sort of pressure is not entirely bad because 
I think it, this is a global problem that requires all of us all around the world to, to deal with it. So in, in that way, I, I noticed that uh, some of the major companies that are very heavy uh, emitters of carbon, I've discussed with them and look at the plans, and they are taking a lot of action to deal with it. For instance, some of the uh, oil majors are moving towards renewable energy and investing hugely in renewable energies uh, and uh, in reducing energy usage and so on. So I would say that as consumers, uh, we, will, we can do our part in the choices that we make as well as in our own personal habits in, and in being prepared you know, to pay a little more uh, when the need arises. Uh, because if you make choices, today you are not quite at the stage where uh, it is efficient, but we have to look for the most efficient way and how do we catalyze the demand for that. Now, for businesses, uh, I, I would say that apart from responding to this, there are lots of things that businesses can do in the way that you look at your own uh, energy and carbon footprint. Many companies have committed to uh, do this. But beyond your own company, I would strongly encourage two uh, companies to come together mm. to build alliances to look at what they can do together. So one of the... Uh, um, projects that came out of our Emerging Stronger Task Force, which I convened due in the midst of the COVID, is this Alliances for Action. So in the Alliances for Action, companies as well as the government regulators come together to discuss possible solutions and to prototype solutions. And this Alliances for Action try to tackle very, um, very, uh, very solvable problems. We hope that we want the alliances to be able to come up with a solution within six months to a year. And the, the emphasis is on a bias to action. You know, go and do something about it and test whether it works. And one of these alliances for action is Climate Impact X, which I mentioned in my speech. Mm. And this is an alliance involving DBS, Singapore Stock Exchange, Stanchart, Stanchart Bank, and Tamasic Holdings. Now, if we succeed, you'll be the world's first carbon exchange and marketplace to use satellite monitoring machine learning, and blockchain technology. And this will provide a level of transparency, integrity, and the quality of carbon credits. So this is just one example, and there are many other examples of what businesses can do. And I, I think if we encourage businesses to be more innovative, which is also part of my speech, I hope that a lot more good solutions can come out of this. <laughs> I want to tell you this encounter I have with somebody at the supermarket. Uh -huh. I was buying my toothpaste. Uh -huh. Then he asked me, do you know why they have to put the toothpaste, the tube, in a box? Isn't uh -huh. it a waste of uh, paper? Oh, really? You are buying the toothpaste to go back. Not the box. Yeah, you are not buying the box. <laughs> and on the toothpaste, you already have all the branding. Uh -huh. So why is it necessary to have the toothpaste tube into a box? So I say, sorry, uncle, if you find a... Toothpaste without a box, toothpaste tube without a box, and the tube will probably be all be uh, uh, what you call bended or knocked over. You wonder whether who have recycled this uh, toothpaste tube, so you won't buy the toothpaste tube, right? Uh -huh. And he said, "Okay, you are the smart guy, so you better go and design how we can sell the toothpaste tube without having to make a box for it, which you discard anyway the moment you go back and use it for your uh, dental hygiene." So this is something that we have to think about. Uh, DBM, uh, this is one of those funny things that happen. Uh, that's why I don't go to the supermarket. I try to leave it to my wife. <laughs> okay, I think, thank you for that uh, response, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, asked people to poll themselves uh, uh, to give us an idea of this um, uh, question. Just now we... Uh, told all of the participants to uh, respond to the question. So maybe we can uh, uh, look at that. Wow. The question given to the uh, participant here is, what do you think is the most critical factor in helping city to emerge more resilient and sustainable? So there are 
uh, four choices given to our participants to choose. Uh, if I may read it, number one, political will, number two, financial and technological resources, number three, public support whole of society approach, number four, regional and international collaboration. So the participants were asked to pick off uh, what they think is the most critical factor. And DPM, as you can see, yeah, the polling result has come in. Uh, maybe I should let you comment on it. Uh, you see all the four uh, critical factors and most people seem to uh, think that political will is everything. Yeah? Uh, in this respect, they don't think money is an important thing. Without your budget for us in the last one and a half year, I think we will all be uh, in Singapore, we say Peng Sang. It means we are under the table or uh, having serious problem finding our uh, uh, money to survive. But the political will is now listed as the most important or the most critical factor. Then we have, um, oh, now the number has changed, sorry. Public support, whole society approach. That's the most important. 48% of those poll here say that that is the most important. Public support, whole society approach. Then political will come number two. And um, uh, number three, financial and technological resources. And number four, regional and international collaboration. So, Deputy Prime Minister, you may wish to comment on this. Well, King Yang, my first comment is either the question is badly uh, designed or the question is very cleverly designed. Badly designed because, uh, or cleverly designed, depending on know how you read it, is that actually you don't have uh, a, a fifth column, a, a fifth uh, choice. Fifth, fifth choice, yeah. Uh, called all of the above. Ah. <laughs> and you ask people to say, what is the most critical factor? Now, in, in, uh, in statistics, there is uh, something called, or, called correlation. And I would say that you know, all these factors are highly correlated. That's why you are the Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> so you, uh, so, but I, I will fully agree with our, uh, those who responded to this poll. The public support and the whole society approach is really the most critical factor. If, that is, if, you, if, I, if you force me to choose only one. But at the same time, how does that translate into all, all the others? I would say that it translates into, your public support will translate into political will because your politicians will have to respond to this uh, public support mm. yeah, and the public quest for this. And this is where you see the differences in the reaction among uh, uh, different societies around the world and how the government responds to this. The, the extent to which the public feels strongly about a particular issue. It's not only necessary for things to be done by the public, but also for changes to be made. And I mentioned in one example that if you are not having to pay a little more for that, are you willing to do so? So indeed, if you have public support, uh, that would be very helpful and the whole society approach because none of this problem can be solved in isolation. Um, I would say that the one comment that I have, the other comment I have is that I think there is too little uh, in, in your question about financial and technological resources. Because I, I do feel, I mean, having run the Monetary Authority of Singapore, especially during the last uh, global financial crisis, I would say that finance and how finance is channeled has a major effect on stability and on change. And what sort of change you want to drive? Because Without the financial resources flowing to the right places, I may have a great project, but no one wants to fund me to do it. How, how do I ever get it going? So I, I would say that finance, it would be important. And technological resources, because I don't think you can deal with resilience and sustainability without investing in research, without thinking about what is a good solution. And COVID is a good example. Mm. I mean, you have a pandemic of this nature. If not for the amount of R&D work that had been done, uh, over the last at least you know, many, many years where we understand even what a, hu what a genome is about and the breakthroughs in our genetics, there's no way we could have a, a vaccine 
in, in the current form because the whole MRA, mRNA vaccine comes out of all this research on, yeah. the, the, on the genome. So I would say that it will be um, important for us to put enough emphasis on finance and on technology. Also, the other area which, um, which strikes me as uh, troublesome is only 6% of your respondents <laughs> say regional and international collaboration is important, as opposed to 48% who say public support, whole of society. So actually, eight times more people think that whole of uh, society and public support is important. So no need for ASEAN? No need for ASEAN, yes, indeed. For, according to the poll. <laughs> regional. And uh, climate change is one clear example. The pandemic is another example where I don't think uh, each of us in our own society you know, uh, uh, is able to just close ourselves up unless you are a big continental economy like the US or China and say, well, it's okay, I can close my border, I can still survive. But for most of us, most countries are smaller and uh, even the Europeans find it important to have the European Union to integrate the economy. Mm. So I, I do hope that uh, we encourage greater collaboration, particularly when we deal with issues like, like this, which are cross-border in nature. And the more we can share our research findings, the more we can collaborate in technology, the better it is for us. So for the uh, audience online, let me just say simply, the question that we asked our participants was, what do you think is the most critical factor in helping cities to emerge more resilient and sustainable? And then four choices were given. Political will, financial and technological resources, public support whole of society approach, regional and international collaboration. The Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore said, actually, this is not well framed. <laughs> there should be a number five called all the above. Yeah. So, uh, this is for pe people like me who can't decide on... on... Uh, well, but I think there is an element of uh, truth in the whole thing because I think in today's context, uh, when everyone can get a lot of information online and give their opinion about this and that, yeah, and uh, everybody is actually quite uh, closely interconnected, it's not possible just to simply take one particular factor given to say that that seems to be the most important. I think public support and whole society approach listed as the most important. I feel commonsensically it looked quite plausible. Yes. Yeah. And then those people who are politically attuned say political will also important. So that's number two. Yeah. The people who are making a lot of comments about how things are run and the people who are in politics don't really think about finance and technology. Yeah. And don't really think about regional or international. They just think of themselves, their country. So it makes sense. Well, the Prime Minister, I think we have this poll. I think next time we'll do a better job and framing it even more. Uh, we go down to basement. Uh. Now we're only <laughs> at uh, road level only. Yeah. Uh, we thought we have uh, come down from the penthouse to the road level, but now you say we have to go one more. Yeah, to cover all, uh, all the above. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think we have enough of this talking among ourselves now. Maybe we should a bit of uh, uh, more open and ask questions from happy to from yeah. from, from, from um, um, the other uh, uh, members of the audience online as well as here. And um, I think there will be some questions uh, which our organizer have uh, received. Um, okay. The first question from Dr. M. P. Sukumara Naya. The question is from Singapore's experience. What are the broad strategy that sites, cities, I think, uh, cities, yeah. cities can adopt to hasten the recovery process after a disruptive event like what we have witnessed uh, regarding the COVID-19? I suppose, yeah. DPM, uh, maybe you can take a shot at this. Dr. Nair's question. Well, I think Dr. Nair has asked a very uh, important and a very good question because uh, my own belief is that we must expect disruptions. 
uh, the, you know, in my public service career, I have encountered quite a few of this. One of them is the Asian financial crisis in 97, 98. And then followed by that, uh, followed then we had the dot-com bubble, we had SARS in early 2000, we had the global financial crisis, and now you have the COVID crisis. So, um, in fact, uh, when, when I was handling the global, during the Asian financial crisis, uh, one of the uh, uh, things which I learned was a book that was produced uh, many, many years back on uh, financial market crashes, that it will happen and you better be prepared for it. So beyond financial <coughs> market crashes, I would say that this disruptive events, as the world becomes more interdependent and more uh, integrated, uh, it, the disruptions will, the, the opportunities for disruptions will come more frequently and it's important for us to be uh, prepared for it. Mm. So first point I would say that expect disruption. Second, it's important that uh, in every disruption, to treat each as a different crisis. It may look the same, but it may be quite different. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was involved in the Asian financial crisis uh, because I was then in the Prime Minister's office uh, working with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and I was in the front line of the global financial crisis. But the two are both financial crises of one point or another. But the causes and the solutions are quite different. And now uh, we are dealing with the COVID pandemic crisis, which is not, uh, which started as a health crisis, but which then morphed into an economic crisis, which then morphed into a political social crisis in many parts of the world. So I would say that uh, being clear that each one is different so that we don't end up fighting the last war and deploying the wrong tools uh, for doing that. But that said, uh, it is also very important for us to learn from every crisis. So even if we don't apply the wrong lessons, but it's important to learn what has this crisis taught us. And I would say that um, in the case of our ex Singapore's own experience with SARS, the, as following SARS, we, the government decided to build the National Center for Infectious Diseases because we took uh, crisis and crisis coming out from a healthcare a pandemic like that can happen. And uh, therefore, uh, NCID became a very important part of our institution. And over the years, we've been uh, developing people with that area of specialty. Mm. So what has COVID taught us on this? I mentioned a number of points about you know, building cities that are more resilient. And one aspect of our resilience must be resilience to uh, future pandemics. Because I think future pandemics is, is not a matter of if, but a matter of when. So what, how do we upgrade uh, our healthcare facilities, our NCID and so on? I mentioned that in many cities, uh, the healthcare capacity was quite uh, inadequate. And in the very early stages especially, uh, I have met a number of uh, companies in Singapore who have also developed, uh, who responded to the call to um, produce masks because they felt strongly that, well, this is going to be important. So the technological capabilities that they have grown was then repurposed very quickly to producing masks. But even in that, uh, we, we had problems because it is very easy for countries to uh, say, well, you know, my citizen must come first and therefore you have export restrictions of all kinds. So it is very important for us to really have an agreement among countries about providing each other with a certain level of uh, resilience. And so resilient supply chain will be an important part of how we uh, need to deal with this and come out of this stronger. So each crisis is different, but at the same time, let's learn from it and prepare ourselves better. And I would say that uh, Therefore, part of that learning must translate into action. Mm. And the action must be to invest in our future. So it will be a future that we cannot, you know, after such a major crisis, to assume that the future is just like the good old days uh, will be totally unrealistic and I would say irresponsible. We'll have to think about what does the future mean for individuals, for communities, for businesses of various uh, shapes and sizes. 
And if you think about individuals, I will say that individuals' needs from babies to seniors will be very different. And in the same way, business needs from your hawkers in the hawker centres or small businesses to your large multinationals will also be different. Mm. So I, th I think it's very important for our business community and for our whole of society to talk about what is it that uh, we need to do to hasten the recovery. But your, the emphasis of Dr. Nair's question about what can we learn, what can we, how can we uh, prepare for disruption? You know, because implicit in your question is what after a disruptive event, implicit in your question is that there will be other disruptive events. Yeah. And implicit in your question too is that we can recover and we, will has, we, we should recover. The question that you have is how can we hasten the recovery process? So the sentiments are, are all, uh, all right, you know, that we, we must expect crisis to happen, we must expect disruption to happen, we must aim for recovery, and we've got to think of how best to minimise the cost of an event like that and to hasten our recovery. So my last point to that is really on two major areas. One is really about people, that uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, it is only when people have a... a a level of knowledge that they know what they should do, and a level of trust in our society, in the uh, authorities. If a scientist come out and say, well, you know, this is a highly transmissible uh, virus, and we say, no, this is just nonsense, and I'm going to do whatever I want, then I think you, you won't be able to deal with the next pandemic. Because if good credible science-based evidence are ignored, you can't do anything about it. Mm. And therefore, how do we advance the knowledge of people in that uh, area? And how do we um, deepen the trust that our people have of authoritative sources of information? Even during this pandemic, you can see the amount of false information that is spread on the internet whether it's about the virus, the origin of the virus, the, you know, the vaccines, and whether the vaccines will do you more harm and so on. If I'm all for good scientific debate, right, to debate on the facts. But it is dangerous when people exploit social media to purvey their own misguided views and hope that, you know, to turn it into some political advantage or turn it into something that could be actually quite suicidal. So I, I think we need to take a stand, stand on that. And at the same time, to encourage uh, global cooperation in many of these areas, whether it's a COVAX facility, whether it is you know, uh, how we can support the WHO in this. A global crisis requires a global response. But if your global institution is, does not have the credibility or the resources to bring people together, then I think we are in trouble. Yeah, I agree with you, Deputy Prime Minister. But one of the feedback I receive is also that the proliferation of all these different news uh -huh. on social media is so fast. And the response from the scientists and even those in the know uh, has been too slow. So this is something that maybe we can learn or take away from this crisis. Yeah. The people who are knowledgeable must be fast with their response so that the people out in the community may not get the wrong information from those who are maybe just uh, quick on the draw and giving their own view about things. Yes, indeed. And I would say that social media companies must take responsibility for uh, their business because for, for us to just argue that you know, I'm just a neutral platform and anybody can can put information and this is in the freedom of speech. Mm. Um, we have seen how many social media companies have been under a lot of pressure, mm. uh, especially last year during the US election, for them to have to respond, to uh, take down you know, patently false uh, facts and uh, allegations. So I think it's important for us to maintain trust in the information, especially in a pandemic like this, where good, accurate information is quite critical to the response, not just of you and I, but really of everyone in the world. Yeah. I think trust is important, but another T that is important 
is also that we must be tactful. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> because sometimes the scientist got so angry when he tried to explain, instead of explaining the situation, it became more confusing. Yeah. Tech yeah. is very, a lot required in these days of the pandemic. How can I disagree with uh, eminent <laughs> uh, diplomat <laughs> who is also the ASEAN section? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, uh, no, it's not an indictment of anybody. Just that, you know, uh, uh, that's how techfulness comes about. Uh, Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Um, okay, there is a second question. Um, this is from uh, Dr. Sabana Yagam uh, from India. Uh, from Singapore's experience, what are the key elements to build a smart city? Or, oh, DBM, you can elaborate on your speech now. Huh. No, but this question is about smart city. And yeah. I would say that uh, the smart city has... Uh, I, I would say that uh, smart city is one aspect of the city. I actually mentioned a couple of elements, which is mm. about resilient city, about uh, sustainable city. And the mm. smart part of it address one aspect of it, which is how do we keep up with the digitalization trend? And I personally believe that digitalization will affect every aspect of our life, will, aspect, will affect every uh, corner of our uh, economy. Mm. The, you know, as an economist, when I learned economics in, in university, you have the typical structure of analysis is that you have a tradable sector for which you trade with other countries and a non-tradable sector these are domestically oriented sector for which they are relatively protected. Uh, not because of government tariffs alone, but because they are protected. So your neighborhood shop is a great example of a non-tradable sector. And uh, your neighborhood bubble, uh, you know, food stores and so on are yeah, all non-tradable hawker, sectors. Yeah, your but, recipe is tradable. But with digitalization uh, and with e-commerce, you'll find that there are very, very few truly non-tradable sectors left. <laughs> so therefore, uh, it is important for us as part of this smart city to really make sure that um, the digitalization has enormous potential and building smart city will be a very important way for us to improve the quality of life of our people. But we must never forget, uh, never confuse the means and the ends. The digitalization trend is a great means for us to improve access, access to information, access to a whole range of goods and services, uh, access to services. But at the same time, for this to access to translate into a better life for people, it has to be properly uh, managed. Mm. Uh, first, there's always a danger that all this technology can be misused. You can have companies that grow too big to fail, that grow too big to manage. So how do you ensure that they do not engage in anti-competitive practices will be one big part of it. Uh, two, I think the digital inclusion agenda will be very important because you cannot build a smart city when a large part of your population do not quite know how to use the technology itself or worse still do not even have the basic uh, equipment. So the, we will have to really connect the last mile Mm. So that right down to our households, do they even have a, a digital device? I would say that Singapore, for all our efforts in our smart city and all the many years in which we have been rolling out our various uh, use of ICT, we found during COVID that there were a number of people, uh, a number of students even, who did not have the uh, computers at home, who did not have the... Uh, uh, knowledge of how they use it. We have a number of seniors who are, who are quite lost about how to use mm. a smartphone, how to use the new digital payment. So I think uh, we will have to uh, put in a lot of effort in this. I was very glad yesterday that I met a group of uh, people uh, who started this uh, outfit called SG Bono. SG as in Singapore mm. and Bono as in Pro Bono, where they... Uh, went around to look at how they can refurbish computers mm. uh, for distribution and to work together with our schools you know, to ensure better access. So I would say that uh, elements of building a smart city, one major element would be really the education of our people and the providing access to our people. This is not easy. We've got to start from where the various places are. 
The other aspect is really the government is a very major part of a smart city. So how can government services be much more uh, digitalized? And in that way, uh, we can uh, catalyze many of these uh, developments. So for instance, uh, the use of smart payment systems, the use of uh, emails and so on, have been a very important part of it. So during this pandemic, the fact that we had this trace together mm. and uh, as a digital uh, device has been very important in our contact tracing effort in our management of the pandemic. But again, that rests on an earlier point I made, which is really about trust. Because citizens must trust that you are using this data purely for contact tracing and not to, uh, for uh, other purposes. You know? So I think uh, building this smart city has um, uh, many elements. The, the business element to it, the uh, access to people. But my starting point, I think if our starting point is how can, you, how can we improve the life of our citizens? Uh, take that as a starting point, then you work backwards, number one. Number two, who can we work with together? And I would say businesses, NGOs, educational institutions can all be part of this effort. One old friend of mine, a senior citizen, say everything you do in this smart city must be easy to know, easy to get to, easy to own. Yeah, yeah. So, very wise. You yeah, have a lot I, of, I, I, told, I told my Uncle Sam, I say you basically want government to give everything. <laughs> but he said, no, no, seriously speaking, because <laughs> yeah, whenever he punched a handphone, he always punched a no number because he's had his big stubby hand. So he asked for the same... McDonald kind of keyboard, no? uh -huh. double the size of all the alphabet. So these are the kind of issues that we get when we are trying to build a smart city, I suppose. Because oh, I, I should share with you a story since you told this story. About two years back, uh, I was doing an event in my constituency in uh, Tampines mm. with uh, a group of people on uh, teaching our senior citizens how to use uh, the smartphone mm. for payment. So I had a group of uh, volunteers uh, and when I spoke to them, I said, oh, uh, 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 thank you for help, helping us do this. Actually, what, what do you do? They say, oh, I'm a computer programmer. So I was so uh, surprised. And I said, you are a computer programmer and you are spending the whole afternoon here doing this. Wouldn't your time be better used if you go back to your and uh, do some better programming for, for, for us? And he looked at me and said, no, sorry, Mr. Hing, you're wrong. Because he said, actually, as a programmer, I assume that it is so easy for people to do uh, five steps and to get to a solution. But when I was teaching the seniors how to use this uh, smart device, I finally realized the value of one click. Because even three clicks was just too complicated <laughs> for someone who is new. Yeah. And he said, this is so valuable for me. I say, well, I hope that you now come up with a lot better, uh, better programs. So I'll say that this, uh, in a way, is the nature of innovation, that we cannot prejudge what will be the best uh, solution, but people have to be really on the ground and look at how we actually uh, struggle with this. Thank you for that story, sir. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from uh, Ms. Renita Krasta. Oh, she is group... Legal affairs, is it capital land? Yeah. What can be done by the built environment sector to help cities emerge more resilient and sustainable? BPM, I think we are told that the time is catching up, so we have to be quick with this. I think there is another one question coming oh, okay. up. Okay, all right. So I'll say that uh, it's, it's very good that you're asking this because I think uh, behind your question is really about how can we emerge more resilient and sustainable? So this is really about the future. And uh, when we think about the future, there are a lot of things that we can do. First, um, unfortunately for Singapore, we are already quite an established uh, city, and so do uh, many other cities. So when we think about building for the future, there are two aspects. One is, uh, even in Singapore, we have an opportunity to rebuild, uh, to build new estates. Mm. So like, for example, new HDB flats, the... Uh, you know, Tengah Estate and so mm. on, for which we have a new blueprint. We can start with a new blueprint. 
And when we do that, the question is how can we make it more resilient, more sustainable? I, I think our strengths, we must continue to emphasize good urban planning, mm. uh, good land use, and in particular, uh, try to make it you know, as up to date as possible with the technological possibilities. So one major area of technological possibilities for our new, new towns is really about um, <coughs> Uh, going uh, car light because we, in Singapore we are building the MRT lines and every uh, every town will be within 10 minutes walk for MRT line mm. so we, we should rethink how can we make better use of the space between the MRT and our house and how to encourage walking, cycling how to build that connectivity so that people don't you know Singaporeans <laughs> are very busy people but if you and so are cities, you know, city folks are all very busy people. But uh, the, if we can encourage healthy lifestyles even in between and encourage people to walk to the MRT stations uh, within 10 minutes, you take the MRT, it's not only more energy efficient because the MRT lines, the public transport lines are the most carbon efficient. So how do we uh, build that into the town? And to, how do we encourage the build the reduce, reuse and recycle into the town itself. So I've, in fact, I've been looking at some of the efforts that some cities are making in, reduce, in recycling waste. And a lot of our food waste, for example, can, must not only be reduced, but should be recycled. So when I was an MP in uh, Tempanis, uh, in our Tempanis hub, we had uh, recycling facilities that reduce the amount of garbage that we collect every day from four trucks to just one truck. And oh. the recycling is done to turn the food waste into compost. And that is then used for gardening in, in, our, in the Tampanese hub as well as in the uh, community gardens all around. So building for both a new place and an old place for us to be more resilient and sustainable are all uh, quite doable. The question is how do we work together with government agencies as well as with the private sector and with our people's effort to encourage this. And I, I've seen many of our students studying this subject who are very enthusiastic and I hope we can support them. Okay, sir. Yeah. I'm told that time's up. Actually, the last question is the most interesting one. Uh -huh. But I don't think we have time to do that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, last question, uh, maybe just for DBM's uh, knowledge. Uh, ah, you see. I know why no time up, no time huh. anymore. What area should the new generation leaders pay more attention to in planning for the new normal? Well, I, I have a very simple answer to that, which is something which I've been saying all, all, all around, which is that whatever we planned, focus on what people need. Okay. What do we need to learn, work, play, interact with other people, to connect with people, and also my belief that cities are here to stay, cities will become more important, and that how do we build resilient cities, sustainable cities, uh, is something which not you and I can do alone, but if we can bring together a partnership within our society and with people around the world, we can build for a new normal. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. Actually, what I was supposed to do is to wrap up, but uh, since the conversation is so interesting, we don't have to do that. I didn't have to do that, actually. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for this uh, time that you have shared with us. Uh, I think most of us enjoy this uh, uh, knowledge that we acquired from your conversation today with us. Thank no, you very much. Because you have very good questions. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to thank DPM Heng and Ambassador Ong for generously sharing their time and insights with us today. We have now come to the end of this session. May I invite audience members to remain seated while DPM and Ambassador take their leave. Okay.
playback of this session will be available in the virtual platform resource gallery in a few hours. Before you leave, we invite you to use the QR code or link on the screen to fill in your feedback form. Thank you and stay safe.